welcome to the Donahue Group, an award-winning show full of political chatter and insights. We're delighted to be with you and glad you could join us. I'm going to go around and introduce our hearty group, Cal Potter, former state senator, Tom, Tom Paneski, former alderman, Ken Risto, former person in charge of social studies at the uh, Sheboygan Area School District. A bunch of has-beens. And me, I'm Sarah Palin. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm actually just Mary Lynn Donahue, a small town lawyer, and happy to be um, chatting about some city and county issues. Uh, we, and we have a fair amount to talk about today, which is a, always a nice, a nice uh, situation to be in. Ken Risto here says that he's all pumped up. Let's start then by talking about the changes in the police department. Don't care. <laughs> <laughs> of course you care. Of course I care. Um, <laughs> let me just put the, um, put the uh, uh, ordinance in, or the plan in perspective. The uh, Salary and Grievance Committee recently voted three to one to approve the retirement of uh, seven officers, including Chief Kirk and Deputy Chief Shervin, and then some of the... Uh, more upper level lieutenants and sergeants and so forth uh, at a savings of $309,000 to the city on an ongoing basis. Each of them will get paid $1,400 uh, for each year of service and um, I'm not quite sure how much that's going to cost but overall it's clearly a savings. Um, the chief says it's a good idea but only if that money that's going to be saved is used uh, for officers on the street. Uh, Alderman Sirk voted against it because he's really pretty afraid of what will happen to the police department management if all the upper echelon folks are gone. What do you guys think? I, I'm gonna, I need one more piece of information. When do they expect to retire? I'm just uh, by the end of the year. By the end of the year. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep. I missed that uh, in the course of the... I've been gone, so I haven't been reading the papers fully. Yeah. So. Okay. S San Antonio Sam here, but I do <laughs> notice you're dressed uh, for... Uh, everyone's in blue here today, which I think Augers well state, for the right? uh, <laughs> yeah, augurs well for the election. A mere 17 points now, Tom. But let me not di di digress. So, what do you think? Uh, well, you know, this is sort of a side opinion. I did hear the, you know, that there was going to be a reorganization, and the <clears throat> the chief was retiring. And I thought, my first reaction was, uh, they're copping out. To, <laughs> as a pun, they have a ch they're instead of moving into the new station getting it squared away, getting it organized, making sure that things run smoothly, because anytime you move into a new place, there's little idiosyncrasies and uh, things that aren't quite. They're going to, uh, in my, that's just what I thought, they're, they're abandoning ship. They're going to they're gonna move out, they're going to retire, and let everybody else move in and handle it. I thought that's the first thing that came to my mind. Now. In fact, they should be able to move into the station, as I understand it, in November. And one newspaper article did quote, Kirk is saying, Chief Kirk is saying that he would be there in the new station through the end of December. So, but I understand what you're saying. Long term, there are certainly Long term, I mean, they could, I was thinking, gee, retire next year, you know, retire mid-year or something, but get the station up and running. You've got new people moving in, uh, all sorts of different kinds of activities going on. You've got to establish some patterns, uh, and all those good people are going to be gone. Uh, so... Maybe that's a plus. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll spin it as a plus. The other, the, the uh, newer people get to set their own uh, patterns, uh, not beholding to the uh, older establishment. Mm -hmm. They get to decide uh, how they want to do it because the older establishment's mm -hmm. going to be gone. Is there, well, and what and are don't the tell me you don't care. No, I, <laughs> I don't care. What are the chances, given the city budget, that that money is going to go back into police officers? I mean, because we're looking at a city budget that really faces some, some real challenges, right? Well, yeah. I mean, particularly Alderman Gisha. Uh, I believe Mayor Perez's executive budget uh, came in for a flat tax rate. Um, Gisha, I think, wants to decrease it by a nickel, a, a nickel per hundred, nickel per hundred or nickel per thousand dollars of uh, <clears throat> assessed value. Must be a nickel per hundred. Um, and... <laughs> In fact, there was a lot of debate on the blog, the Sheboygan Press blog. I couldn't resist looking. And Professor Paneski, there was some question about, for a $100,000 house, how much a nickel <laughs> reduction oh. <laughs> in, in the rate would mean. And one of the writers suggested that whatever it was, that money be used for math classes for the Sheboygan Area School, School District. So I thought that was 
I'm sorry, that's a small aside. A um, rate per thousand, uh, so a nickel on a hundred thousand, that's a hundred, what is that? A hundred <laughs> times for a hundred thousand dollar house? I don't know. No. In any event, we'll move right along. Um, but I think, uh, yeah, I think your point's well taken. I think that the retirement is being premised on the fact that there'll be one or two new uniformed uh, officers mm -hmm. on the street. But Cal, what do you think? Well, I think it's probably a good deal, and that's why they're, they're grabbing at it. I think there's some health care payments uh, as well as the compensation for years of service. Those offers don't come along very often, and I think uh, that's something that these guys probably maybe would like their new office in the <laughs> police station, but when you, you're offered health insurance at a young, relatively young age uh, and retirement, you grab it. And so I'm sure that's part of it, plus the fact that uh, they're concerned about uh, more money for the for the police department, but I think Ken is right. Uh, Any time you you have money sort of earmarked, there's always ways around it. <laughs> Social Security was earmarked too, <laughs> and yeah, look yeah. where that has gone. So there are all kinds of uh, accounting tricks that can be used. I've seen it used a lots of times. Uh, so I don't know that this is written in stone. Yeah. I do think that the council support will be strong because Chief Kirk's support for the plan is sure. strong. I think if he were expressing any kind of concerns or suggesting he had been pushed out or he couldn't work with the mayor or anything like that, but none of that is being said. Yeah, and they, have, they have two deputy chiefs now, don't they? The criminal uh, investigation one. and traffic? Yeah. yeah. Or, I mean, uh, operations? They, they do. It, CID they used to have two, and I believe they have reduced that to, to, to one, just one deputy. One, because they used to yeah. have two, I know. They used I to have know. three, then they got down to two. Yeah. And now they're going to go down to one. They had a lot of management in that, uh, in that particular department. There's, there's no doubt about it. So I think it's a creative and good idea. I think they should look outside the department for a replacement for the chief. I know that's very difficult. And um, I was on the Police and Fire Commission when we hired Chief Kirk, and he was clearly, from my perspective, the best candidate. Uh, but there are always difficulties when you hire from the inside, and then there are difficulties when you hire from the outside. And of course, the city's last ex um, experience with the chief from outside was not good. I don't remember the fellow's name, but I believe he was from Stevens Point and basically never really moved to town and had divided loyalties. And I, I don't think even lasted a year, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. So, so we'll see what happens. The city council has been busy. We have now passed. That's never good. Um, <laughs> They're busy? They've been active. Yes, they have. Yes. Um, and what uh, the council did at its meeting last week was to uh, pass a comprehensive uh, ordinance regulating where sex offenders, registered sex offenders, can live in the city of Sheboygan, uh, 2,000 feet from a variety of places where children would likely congregate. And um, it is uh, essentially, from what I understand, means that there's no place really in town that a sex offender, registered sex offender, can now live. Uh, the ordinance also makes it uh, an offense for a landlord to rent to a registered sex offender if that person is within 2,000 feet of a school, church, daycare center, park, uh, recreational trail. There are just a long list of places. Um, so we've now basically made uh, the city of Sheboygan off limits to registered sex offenders. Not all sex offenders need to register under, under the law, um, but many do, uh, including minors. And uh, so it'll be interesting to see, um, to see <clears throat> what happens. You know, when you, when you think about 2,000 feet, I, I was trying to put it into terminal, I, into something that I more, visual, more math again, Tom. Visibly, <laughs> visually see, and you know, a football field, 100 yards is, what, 300 feet. Mm -hmm. So we're talking six football, almost seven, almost seven football fields distance. So about two thirds of a mile. And it's uh, no, five thousand two hundred eighty mm -hmm. feet. So it's. Little less than half. Less, less than, than half. half a mile. Okay. But so you know, all those sex offenders really can't travel beyond that. So that 2,000 feet is really critical. So you, <laughs> yeah. It's bizarre. <laughs> it's bizarre. It's so bizarre. Within, it, within where uh, children live. So well, children live 
So yeah, you're right. There's no place that they could live in the city. And, and other communities are doing this. I mean, yeah, if you watch exactly television, right. everybody, everybody's falling over each other to pass these ordinances. I don't know what's going to happen to the people who are, <clears throat> you know, released from prison, where they're going to go. You're going to have a congregation of mountain rural townships or something. I don't know what well, you're going to do. Well, Dirk Seilman is very concerned <laughs> that the town of Mosul <laughs> yeah, <laughs> will become a dumping ground <laughs> for We should have put a ring around the city and they got to live in this ring, you know, 2,000 feet away from the city. Well, there's certain practical difficulties. I do think what is happening is that there will be a move by all of our towns and villages and cities within Sheboygan County now to pass these kinds of ordinances. So you will come to the point where there will be literally no place in Sheboygan County that a sex offender can live. Do you remember the story called A Man Without a Country? Yes. And it prohibited this fella, and you probably remember it better than I do, but it stuck with me just from being a, a little kid. Um, <coughs> uh, somebody who was punished by saying basically you can't have a country that you can live in. And I think this is you know, sort of coming to it. My question is what problem does it solve? I think one could suggest that there would be fewer child sexual assaults um, but there are many, now these folks register and they're kept track of. Now there will be a push, there'll be more underground activity, there'll be less registration. Uh, people who have family in Sheboygan County won't be able to, you know, they come out of prison and they won't be able to come back and live with a spouse unless the spouse has been in a place for two years or longer. Current sex offenders are grandfathered in. Yep. So if you are a registered sex offender, you live in your apartment and you don't get evicted, you're fine. But if you do get evicted, as the way I read it, essentially you're going to have to not only leave town, but you're going to have to leave the county. Is there a definition of sex offender, like they've been found guilty of a, a felony or something? Right, there are four different classes of sexual offenses in Wisconsin statutes and the registration law, which comes from Megan's Law, or Megan's Law, uh, which was passed in Florida some years ago. Um, I don't know the details, but it's for more serious sex offenses. Uh, and um, so not every... Classified and right. And you have to register. Right. Yeah. So not every sex offender is required to register. And uh, so now there's a, a, you know, a concern that the judges will say, well, you don't have to register as a sex offender. Well, that's not going to happen. I mean, th that's not. What if you have a juvenile who, and juveniles found guilty of serious sex offenses can be ordered to register. They're sent away to a treatment group home and they want to come back to town to reintegrate in, you know, with their families and so forth. These children aren't going to be able to come back because unless their family has been in an apartment or a house for more than two years. So I, I just think that there are a lot of pieces of this that maybe haven't been thought through. And then I, from my perspective, of course, I think it's constitutionally infirm. And I did offer to Alderman Gisha that I would represent the city, <coughs> if and when sure. it's sued, but I, uh, <coughs> uh, I think it might be a losing case. I don't know. Um, the, the council's resolution was carefully crafted, relies on an Eighth Circuit case from Iowa that found a similar law to be constitutional. It hasn't really been dealt with in Wisconsin, so it'll be interesting, uh, it'll be interesting to, see, um, to see what happens, but is it good public policy? Well, you know, the repercussions for the Department of uh, Corrections is going to be difficult. What are they, what are they going to re require, be required to do if you can't find a placement for your mm. your ex inmate? Do you then have to set up sort of halfway houses for people who have served their time, uh, apartment house? And then is that a good type of situation where you put ten people together in a rural area uh, who have served their time but can't live any place? You have to then create a sort of an island where these people are housed. I'm not so sure that's good public policy or good use of taxpayers' money and corrections time to start finding housing for people who 
have served their time. So I can see down the road this is going to be very problematic. Just to, what do you do with these people? Well, they won't be able to live in the state. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I do think this has a bit of a snowball effect. I mean, do you want to be the final municipality standing that hasn't passed one of these ordinances? Yeah. No, not at all. Not at all. I mean, it might lessen the uh, costs of probation and parole in Sheboygan County because there'll be fewer <coughs> people to supervise because they'll have to be transferred to other counties or other states. Thirty information. You always bring up the interesting question: Are there? You're talking about the full the state being every village and every town uh, having some kind of laws. Is there some sense of how many communities have passed laws like this already? I don't know. Or is it just a very small number at this point? So we could be far away from that situation. I would not be surprised within a year if most of the municipalities in Sheboygan County have not passed an ordinance like this. And while I think it, from my perspective and my limited, truly limited constitutional scholarship, I don't think it passes muster. It might. I mean, it might be held to be constitutional. And uh, so, so it's interesting. And I just, I just don't want people to think that their children are going to be safe from sex offenders. And, and that's, that's the concern, is that this does not solve that problem. You know, I could see all kinds of interesting little, you know. So you, somebody does find a place uh, 2,000 feet away, and then you get a builder building a house that's close to 2,000 feet away, and a family moves into the house. Now the sex offender is no longer 2,000 feet away. Uh, because yeah. a family has moved into an area. Well, the 2,000, the 2000 foot requirement is absurd in the sense that we don't want these people in proximity of children. That's not the purpose of it at all. The purpose of it is to create a zone where we don't want people like this in our community. And I understand that given the snowballing or the, the irrational race to the bottom that's probably going to happen, that Sheboygan doesn't want to be the last, as Mary Lynn said, the last enclave that actually opens up its stores to any particular group of citizens that we may or may not want in our midst. You know, that's, I understand that. I also understand why 14 aldermen don't have the courage to vote no, because you know how that's going to play out. And I hope to God that people who challenge this law don't try to seek relief in the Wisconsin Supreme Court system or any of our local courts, because they're all elected officials, and we all know what those campaigns are going to look like. So now we have to rely on the wisdom of the framers that gave federal judges lifetime parole, lifetime judges <laughs> parole, terms. Yeah. <laughs> and that actually is parole, I think, in some cases. You know, no one, uh, and I think it's kind of odd, you know, what's next? Murderers? Or people who have been convicted of manslaughter, who've served their time? How about people who have been guilty of armed robbery? Let's, well, my question and, and now, is... And now we're, you know, basically what we're simply going to create is you serve your time, it used to be in the old civics classes, and I'm not, you know, I find it odd that I have to defend sex offenders, but I think there's a greater principle here uh, that I was learned, I thought was taught in my American civics classes. You pay your, you pay your dues, mm -hmm. you go back to society, and we accept you, we accept you back in, into this community. And there seems to be all sorts of exaggerated recidivism rates being thrown around to begin with, but we don't, punish people for something they might do. And I think we're forgetting that being an American is hard duty. <laughs> I mean, we all put up with things we don't like because we want to live in a free society. There's things that I read I don't like. There's things I watch on TV I don't like. There's things on the internet I really don't like. And if I were the dictator of the universe, I'd get rid of them. And it's just one of these things where I think we forget that there's a certain amount of risk. Mm -hmm. And I say that as a, a husband and as a stepfather. I'm not I'm not excited about having certain folks in our communities. But there are lots of different folks I don't like in my community necessarily. But we live in a free society, and that's part of the risk we have to take. And I think we often forget that. And I'm just, I just really am very concerned that this is just the tip of the, tip of the sword. You know? and, and, and I think the other issue is, before I yield the floor, is, <laughs> is if you really are interested in protecting your child from sexual abuse, you know, worry about you know, your crazy Uncle Louie or somebody in your family structure. Because those are the, you know, we always talk about this murder. You know, the person most likely to murder you is a member of your family, somebody you know. And the same thing with, with sexual abuse in this community, as any social worker in this town will tell you. 
is that it's, 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 the predators are the people within your own families, the people that are in the roofs, the, underneath your own roof in many cases, not this, the, the cases that tend to get in the media where there's one person soliciting in a park, you know, behind a bush. I mean, those, those, aren't, those are not the vast majority of the kinds of uh, things that threaten our kids. It really isn't. And so if you think this law is going to protect you, you're, you're just, you're, you're living in a dream world. Well, well there said. It is. Well, said. well said. There it is. We're so now on. my chance for public office has been completely decimated on no, this show. No, I was going right? to say, what we'll destroy this We're going to vote to your district and vote for you. Yeah. No, Ken, actually, <laughs> you destroyed that chance probably a long time ago. But That's in okay. any event, okay. uh, we... And I understand, again, I really do understand why the older, you know, when they're faced with this race to the bottom, you really don't want to be, but it, it, Either there is this big, vast movement and we're, the la we're, we're going to be in the last in line, or we're the first. And if we're the first, then, you know, shame on us. Or if we're one of the first, shame on us. All right. Said by the guy in the blue shirt. Um, the, um, oh, <laughs> that's Tom's right. Got a blue shirt. <laughs> <laughs> you all have blue shirts blue shirt on. Team today. <laughs> there we go. I love all it. Be poll I love watchers. it. Well, you see, it matches my eyes. So, you know. And that's we, why we, we all got together and did We must it have like coordinated that, yeah. that in advance. Um, layoffs, uh, it's certainly been an interesting uh, financial time, to put it mildly. Tom's wife is a stockbroker, and I expect she's probably not sleeping much at night anymore, but. Uh, in it has been stressful for her, I would say. Well, and for everyone. Um, news today that Kohler is laying off 50 people, 38 of them managerial spots, which I thought was interesting, and, and 12 line, uh, line workers. Um, and then the city, um, excuse me, the Finance Committee uh, has uh, been reviewing the Department of Public Works budget, which calls for a 4% uh, percent decrease which in essence would be a layoff of five people. We haven't really talked about laying off anybody at the city level for an awful long time. And um, so it seems to me that the council and particularly the mayor are pretty serious about keeping the, um, the tax rate in line. Uh, what do you think? We're gonna see more of these uh, layoffs? Well, as long as yeah. people uh, say they're gonna have a no tax increase with the value of real estate not going up, you don't have a built-in uh, let's say, say a goose laying gold, golden eggs anymore. Um, actually, we're having declining values. Uh, and I think uh, unless energy costs do stay down as they've come down, um, you know, you're not going to have that, that as an avenue. You're going to have to pay your, your gas bills and your heating bills as a municipality just like anybody else. So where do you get the blood out of the turnip here? I mean, it comes down to personnel, which are usually 70% of your costs. Exactly. So you, you, you're between a rock and a hard place. And so uh, it was inevitable, I think, that eventually once the, once the uh, contingency funds were spent, uh, you're back to the wall here, and it's people. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's a sad reality. Yeah. All we can do is hopefully the economy turns around a bit for stockbrokers and other benefits, as well as uh, the energy costs uh, stay down. Tom, when you were on the council, was there a um, was there a strong feeling about keeping the tax rate um, uh, I th steady? Yeah, so. Yes, I re remember. Well, we don't. We didn't. We wanted to keep our bond rating solid. That was always in front, and uh, n nobody liked to raise taxes. I. I yeah. Well. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. So I think there was, I don't know how strong it was, but uh, mm -hmm. it was, we really didn't want to raise taxes if we could, mm -hmm. didn't have to. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we also stressed that it, uh, oftentimes it, uh, we were such a small part of the overall tax burden. Uh, the school system had, uh, mm -hmm. uh, was the largest part and we then, and then followed by us and then the county. But, uh, you know, your point is well taken because I know Mayor Perez at every opportunity says really the tax bill is not just the, the city. It is the city, it's the county, it's the school district, it's the vocational district, and then there's a tiny little piece for the recreational budget if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Right. And um, so yeah. and we need to, to keep that in mind. But I think, um, the, of course, the school district rate will continue to rise because of the referendum. And we all agreed that we would be willing to pay more for the field houses and for, for a new Jefferson school. 
So yeah, I think your point is, is well taken there, but uh, it'll be interesting. It, we'll talk a little bit in our next segment about uh, the Janesville uh, GM plant closing up a year early, a year in advance. Um, but the specter of, of layoffs is just something that, uh, whether at the city or in private industry, isn't anything that we've really seen in the Sheboygan area. Uh, well, I take that back. Um, Pentair. Pentair there. closed. Yeah. yeah. And of course, not directly in the city, but Tecumseh has certainly been on the ropes for a while. Um, so you wonder what people will do and and how how they will make those adjustments and so forth. So, but uh, public public works has uh, always been it's the easiest one to get at uh, versus public safety because uh, both police and fire could argue those are essential services and you can't afford to scrimp there. Right. But in public uh, works, it's cyclical. Uh, in the summertime, you can hire a lot of temporary people to do your outdoor work and your maintenance and stuff. And then come winter, you can't do those things. And uh, if you have somebody on the full-time payroll, you have to find jobs for them to do. Then, of course, they, do, they paint the furniture, or they paint the benches, they clean up, you know, they do a lot of internal work. But you can only do that so often every year. Right. And so... It's an, easy, it's an easy kind of place to say, well, we don't need to hire a full-time person when this person retired. We just leave the job go and we'll hire a temporary in the summertime. Sure. Do I do work. think that the Department of Public Works head, uh, Bill Bittner, um, seems to have a pretty good grasp. But he's not been here very long, but I think he has a good grasp of the issues and, and what needs to be done and so forth. Just a plug for the Sheboygan Public Education Foundation, known as the E-Foundation, um, which uh, raises money for projects within the school district that are not budgeted for in the, in the, in the public budget. Um, and I, I don't think that we touched on this last time, but the speaking of the field houses, the equipment has to be replaced, and that hasn't been budgeted for. People are being asked to make small donations when they come in to use the equipment. You've started... Have you started working out? Not at, yet. But you will. <clears throat> but I will be. And are you okay with giving $10 sure. to? Sure. I knew that going in. You know, I think there was, among people in circles who were talking about the referendum, understood well in advance that we'll build these things and we'll get people going into them. And qu quite frankly, last year already, there was a conversation in the halls of central support saying, we got to raise money and we should start charging the public. And I was pretty emphatic to saying, of saying, no, you, you promised the public uh, as a condition, well, not a condition legally, but certainly a promise was made publicly that these would be open to the public without charge. You cannot within one year all of a sudden announce surprise. We, you know, everybody knows that that equipment wears out. It's been so, getting tremendous use, uh, at south at least and at north when I've been there. And so... Am I surprised? No. Do I think it's a you know, reasonable thing to do? Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's nice to see the Education Foundation involved because it yep. really is a good group. It has raised hundreds of thousands of dollars, and an excellent board, and we have to say goodbye, and we'll talk again next, next time. <laughs>